After decades of heavy use, the orbits around our planet are now full of junk. Space junk is all the stuff that we've launched into, into orbit that no longer serves a useful purpose. So it's satellites, it's rocket bodies, it's uh, you know, old gloves, it's toolkits that astronauts have accidentally dropped. Basically litter that we've, that we've left, left in space. But why should we care about overcrowded orbits in space? when we've got plenty of traffic congestion right here on Earth. Because from GPS, to cell phones, to the weather forecast, life as we know it on Earth cannot function without satellites above. Unless we tackle the, the debris problem, there is going to be no weather forecast. There is going to be no news story from, from the other side of the world. You're not going to be able to turn on the television and see the World Cup. There are over 1,265 satellites operating overhead right now. And each one needs a clear lane in order to travel safely. <laughs> No one thought orbital debris was much of a threat until around 1970. A NASA scientist named Donald Kessler started making calculations and realized that leaving junk in orbit is a formula for disaster. People tend to think of orbit like a road through space. I mean, as long as you stay on your road, you're not going to get hit. It would be more accurate to think of the Earth as being one big paved planet. And when you want to go someplace, you drive in a straight line from one place to another. Uh, and of course, if you, with no stoplights and, and no place to stop. And you're going to be running into each other all kinds of directions. It, that's exactly what you got in orbit. So I ended up with an equation where I could write the spatial density, its apogee, and inclination. Then you can do neat things like, well, Donald Kessler's key energy, insight is that when chunks of space trash collide into one another, they splinter into more space junk. Unit volume. If you want to know the flux, the spatial density. Each collision sets off an exponential cascade of collisions that will eventually destroy every satellite in orbit. This death spiral is now known as the Kessler syndrome. Integrated over the volume. In other words, if you never launch anything else in space, there will still be this cascading phenomena that continues to grow, and actually it continues until you essentially grind up all the satellites and the small dust particles. Free pass SVN 26. No time critical commanding, no satellite conjunction, good on step six. All data feeds to externals are open and both communication lines to the site are good. No applicable SIFs or TPs. You're good to execute. Copy that, ma'am. The United States Air Force Space Command takes Donald Kessler's predictions very seriously. Those objects are going 17,000 miles an hour. Uh, when you're going 17,000 miles an hour, it does not take a big piece of debris to ruin your day. In the early 1980s, they started keeping tabs on any orbital trash larger than a baseball. Back then, there were 6,000 such objects. Give level one a call on the TTC 5-6. For decades, that number grew only slightly. An international agreement kept space junk under control by sending used rocket bodies down into the upper atmosphere, where they harmlessly burn up. That plan worked until 2007, when the Chinese fired a missile into a weather satellite they no longer needed. It was proof that they could hit such a target and destroy it. I think they did that because they realized that the United States military is critically dependent on space. And, and uh, they felt like if, if, if they were going to be able to effectively respond to whatever challenges they had in the future, they needed to develop a, a way to challenge our space capabilities. Basically, there's not a single military operation that takes place in the world today that is not critically dependent on space capabilities. And if space goes away, we do not fight as effectively as we would otherwise. 
That Chinese target practice demonstrated what a war in space might look like. It also highlighted the danger of any collision in space, intentional or accidental. After the collision, you see quite a compact debris cloud at the start. But then because some of the fragments are thrown into high orbits and some are thrown into low orbits, the speed is different. So you see the, the, the debris clouds stretch out into it and it forms this ring. Now, because the Earth is not spherical, it causes the, uh, that debris ring really to start, to start to stretch out. It, it moves the orbits around the, the planet. So it goes from this kind of compact debris cloud right at the start to the situation where all of that debris ends up being distributed all the way around the planet. That one incident when China demolished its own satellite in 2007 increased the amount of killer space trash by almost 30%. The commander of America's space defense operations feels that worse is yet to come. If you go to war in space and it becomes a kinetic war, you create a debris field that is just unmanageable and you can't operate or fly in it. So I hope to never go to war in space. But at the same time, if we're threatened, we have to be able to defend ourselves and we have to be able to defend ourselves right now. The debris problem continues to grow. In 2009, an American communications satellite collided with an out-of-control Russian Cosmos satellite. That collision gave the Air Force 4,000 more pieces of junk to keep track of. With over 17,000 large objects flying in all directions, Kessler's calculations predict a major collision within five years. <laughs> What happens when a small piece of metal and a spacecraft slam into each other at a combined speed of 30,000 miles per hour? No such collision has actually been observed firsthand in space, so scientists created a full-scale experiment here on Earth. Lots of people fire things like that, for instance, and many things, many physical phenomena do not scale with um, size very well. So we really wanted to get a full-scale, full-size test. This was the size of the object. It was maybe a little bit shorter, but basically a large hollow object is more representative of something that's actually in space, like maybe a small satellite or a piece of a small satellite. Patty Schaefer fired the soup can-sized object into a metal tank at 20 times the speed of sound. Is that T-minus 10? Yes, that's T-minus 10. Nine, eight, and then you hear this. And the building literally shakes a little bit, but I think a lot of it is me, you know, just being freaked out. And then you see your screen flash up, and it's over. All that work is turned into this. So this piece of modern art here is what the tank looks like. Now this is the top of the tank. Right here it folded after it flew through the inside, but you can see it's all splayed out. The intense heat of the explosion turned solid metal instantly into gas. When that vaporized metal cooled and turned back into a solid, Patty found these, hundreds of aluminum flakes. On Earth, they're harmless. But when they're zooming around like bullets in space, they're lethal. Now that's about, uh, what is that, 250 milligrams. So that's a little bit bigger than a, heavier than a ibuprofen pill. And um, the energy that would have on orbit would be about the same as a hot loaded 357 Magnum. So that's a lot of momentum. And the energy would be more like a 50 caliber uh, Browning machine gun sniper round. So if you're gonna think about how dangerous this is on orbit, think 357 Magnum, 50 caliber sniper round, somewhere in there. So if there are many more particles produced than we thought, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more, then it has a snowball effect, because each one of those particles, if there's 10 times more 
there could be 10 times more strikes. And each one of those makes 10, so that's 10 times 10, which is 100. If there's 100 times more, then each one of those can make stripes, which is 100 times 100, which is 10,000. So it snowballs rapidly. The question is, how rapidly is it going to snowball? And the only way we can know that is to know how many of these particles we can't see are actually made.